Lord Jesus, we just come to you. We come to you, Jesus, because we know that you're there at the right hand of the Father. Father, you hear our prayers. Through the advocacy of Jesus, his blood shed on the cross. Jesus, you came, you died on the cross. You gave your blood, your body, took the wrath upon yourself to pay the price for our sin. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day. You rose from the dead and defeated the power of sin and death in our lives. And you made us born again, born again, children of the loving, living Father God in heaven. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful. What a blessing to say these words. Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us. And as we come to your word today and our prayers and the Psalms, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would guide us and give us a message, Lord, that we can not only have in our hearts and minds and souls, but we can bring them home to our wives, our children, our grandchildren, and our friends. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, it's really a special time, and I want to help you guys reach out to the people that we need to be bringing to the group, okay? It's really important. And, it's, and I want to just say it as clearly as I can. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, that, that we are not to stop meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. And what that means is that people would meet together. They have met together in the past. I've been receiving some wonderful messages from people who have been in this group 30 years ago. It's amazing. They call me on the phone out of the blue. I'm, and they're on the other side and living in, in Washington and some other people you know, out, out of the country. All kinds of things are happening. I got this letter from a guy who came here 35, 40 years ago. And he, and he sent me this email and all the things that he's been listening to, all the, the, you know, we're here in the room and he's, we, get, we send out the email that attaches to the YouTube, okay? And he's been listening and he called and he sends his wonderful blessing. And I think about all those years when he used to sit right there on the table and how important it is that we meet together. And I pray for you, like David, you're in there, I pray for you. Where's David? Bring David, bring David back. It's, it's not like what, Tyler, you're a younger guy, so this is what it's all about. We were all young like you. Then we all got old. And the guys, the guys that are here and got old are the guys that, that stayed with it, the guys who stuck in there, you know. And so the, the, the thing is this, that God is looking for something very special in every man. What he's looking for is not perfection, because we, we're not perfect. And he's not looking... For you to do some heroic, you know, some great thing that everybody's going to give you accolades about. That's not what he's looking for. Now, what he's looking for, and this is really important, is a sincere heart that really wants to seek him for all that he is, not all that you are. <clears throat> and as we seek him, because of that, we, we have to be humble and thankful to seek him. And when we do that, we please him. We please God by seeking him. And that and now listen, this is why Jesus, when he went out, he went to the what to the lowest of the lowest, right? And he went to the people, the people said, Well, nobody should go to, or you, these people are lost, or whatever. And he went there. And what did those people do when they saw his love? They knew they weren't capable, they knew they had nothing to offer God. And the more they knew that they had, look at me, zero to offer God, the more the more they weren't, that meant the more God is. Do you understand? And the more you think you are, that diminishes from the glory of God. And let me say it again. This is really cool. This is what God's been giving me. The more that you think you are, or, or the, anything you think you are, diminishes the glory and honor that is deserving to God. Because you, are, you and I are nothing, but we don't realize that because by nature, our natural tendency is to believe more to think more highly of ourselves than we should, okay? And what God wants us to do is what? He wants us to humble ourselves and be thankful and to seek him. Now, if we will do that, I know it's hard. Some of you guys are into the seeking thing so much that you've got an array of places to be. I mean, you, you've got, well, I go here and then I go here and I go here and I go here. You need to be someplace, though, like this, where you can put in a relationship program that will last... 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Because when you're all done and you're there in heaven, the investment that you made by giving of yourself, now here we go, giving of yourself is what God is looking for. He wants you. People say, well, what did God want? He wants you. He wants your desires. 
He wants, when you wake up, he wants you to, the, the first thing to think about is you, you want, I want to be with God. I want to talk to God. I want to pour my heart out to God. I want to, I want to confess whatever sin may happen to be crawling around in my mind. In um, Genesis chapter four, gosh, I memorized this today. I was thinking, and I can't remember the verse. This is when um, God is talking to Cain, okay? And Cain brought in the wrong sacrifice. Not a bad thing, but he brought in what Cain brought in, what he wanted to bring in, which was the crops that he did. He was proud of that. He worked hard for that. And it seems so logical. He worked hard, so he came to give it to God, right? And God said, that's fine, but I don't want, I'm not looking for what you give me. I'm looking for what I've asked you for. And what did he ask for? The blood of a lamb to show that there needed to be what? Blood. Without shedding blood, there's no what? Forgiveness of sin. And the blood, the lamb did what? It, it pointed towards Jesus Christ. And so from the very beginning, everything is pointed to Jesus Christ. And anything, listen to me, that diverts from Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, is not correct before God. And that's why, if you notice today in this world, you can't say the word, you can't talk about Jesus Christ in public because people are what? They're offended. You actually have people saying, we can't talk about Jesus Christ because it offends too many people. Hmm. Think about what that just means. It offends too many people. Do you think that the day is approaching for the Lord to come back? Do you think it is or not? Anybody has any spiritual IQ knows that we are at that time when it's all set up for him to come every day. And what God says is when you see the day approaching, don't stop meeting together because you need to be together. You need to hold on to each other. So the faith that you have is built based on your togetherness with other brothers and sisters in Christ. So now what we're going to talk about today is when um, one last thing on Cain. Um, so Cain comes to, um, to God and then God rejects him and Cain's very frustrated and angry. And God turns back to, to Cain. I love this, the, the dialogue. It's wonderful. And God says, look, it, it, all you got to do is just do the right thing. Just, just do the right thing. Just go ahead and just, I know it's, we got a problem here. Everything didn't work out and you're upset, but go ahead and just do the right thing. And he says, because you got to watch out because sin is what? Crouching at the door, ready to get you. Ready to get you. And then God says this to Cain. He says, you're going to have to what? You're going to have to control that. You have to, in other words, it's there. And you feel it and you know it. And you have to decide by faith, you're either going to trust God and believe him and control whatever it is in your mind and your heart that is sin, or are you going to lose to it? Now, we've all lost, but there now we have this opportunity that God's talking to us, and we have the opportunity to do what? To go and crawl back and to go after it and to do that which is right and turn away from that which is evil. Now, how do we do that? Now, the Bible tells us clearly by eating and drinking the word of God, by studying. And we're going to go through a process now with the Psalms because I want you to know what this is. What happened was that uh, Nancy and I would pray the prayer I gave you before, morning prayer. And then I, I started out, it was just simple. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. It just came out of my heart. That's what happened. So I started putting down the Psalms. Then I started one day, I literally thought, well, you know, I need to open up with something that gives me, like, I need to see, I need to see and know that God's working in my life. And then I thought, well, what Jesus in John 15 says, if you pray these prayers and ask for these things, I'll give them to you. And I thought, now, how does that work? You know, and then I read another place where he talks about you give, you know, what you pray for. And I'm sitting there thinking about it. Then I read and study Jesus and I go through and start reading and I talk about it. And I began to realize as I was studying and teaching and doing the things that what it is is that God has his good and perfect will. And that when you and I come in agreement with his will and we pray, he's there. He'll never leave you or forsake you. His promises are real. And when you, and this is what's strange, when you go from being a single person, where it's just you, you, yourself, me, myself, and I, we're just doing what we want. And then you get over here and you get married 
and now you have a wife and then you start negotiating so that you're still doing what you want, but you, you know, got to give her 10% or 20% or whatever, but you're doing what you want to do. And then all of a sudden she gets more in the relationship over a period of time. The woman gets more powerful because she's not that she's in love with you, but not like she was before in a different kind of way. She loves you. Okay. And you have to begin to be equal, equally yoked and together. Right. And what that means is that the husband has to begin to humble himself and allow the wife to be who she needs to be. And that togetherness comes and creates the marriage that God will use to bring honor and glory to him. Right. And that's why the wife has to do what? She has to submit to the leadership of the husband because you can't have two leaders and move ahead. Doesn't mean they're not equal. Doesn't mean they're not powerful. Doesn't mean they don't get their will. It means that they work it together with their husband and they go together. They go down the path of life. And what God is saying is that you have to decide, listen carefully, you have to decide to give up of yourself because sin is crouching at the door. Right at the door ready to destroy your marriage, your relationship with your children, your businesses, your jobs, everything, including, listen carefully, including your country. Because when one nation under God becomes one nation under anybody you care to name, because see, the God of the country, the United States of America, was the God of the Bible, based on a biblical worldview. All the, all the listen to me, all the information points to that truth. The first book that, that was published by the Congress of the United States of America were Bibles to be put into all the, all the schools and it was like that all the children would learn how to read by reading the Bible. Because, now listen, I taught civics. It seems like a thousand years ago. U.S. history and, and all that. And the reason that we, and, and when I got my uh, teacher's credential and then I went to get my, all the stuff that I worked on from the degree in education, this, it said this, it said, that education, the, we have schools in the United States of America for a purpose. One of the main purposes is to what? Educate quality citizens. Quality citizens that know the difference between right and wrong. To know how to balance a checkbook. In other words, they know about economics. They understand you can't spend more than you have. All these were basics that we taught our children. Because you can't go into the world without knowing that, right? They don't teach it anymore. And now we send people to live out into the world without knowing what to do or how to do it. So when Nancy and I, we're, we're praying and we're, we're going through our life and, and our children's life. And, and, then, and then grandkids came along. I think this is about 10 years ago. I don't know, 15 years ago this happened. And I just said, you know, I need to connect. I need to connect, Lord, with you in a more meaningful way every day. I don't mean just every once in a while I go to church and then I come back and then I go work and then all of a sudden something happens. I need to pray. I find out somebody's sick or somebody, you know, one of the kids gets hurt. We're on the way to the hospital. You know, hey, dad, pray. You know, we got this emergency prayer times, right? Then I thought to myself, man, I don't want to go out in this world today. And especially when the ministry is going all over the world, people are doing all kinds of things. And I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, all the pressures of normal life. I said, I need to know. I need to have the confidence in my faith, knowing that God is at work. And so I went in and I started looking. And, and I'm going to do, this is not on this, but the promises are awesome. But I'm going to look at what it says here. And I'm going to read this with you. And then I'm going to hit on a few points today. And we'll, we'll continue on this. So if you guys would read with me, this is where I come from. This is the attitude I want to have with God every morning. And I pray the same for you. It's an attitude of humility and thanksgiving. This is the day the Lord has made. I pray it for Nancy and I, so I'm going to pray it in the floor. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in that this is our portion and we're thankful for it. That's Psalm 118.24 and then Psalm 16 where it talks about this is our portion. In Psalm 8, 9, it says... O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 143, 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. I need this every morning. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Do you want God to show you the way to go today? Do you want him? Seriously, you have to decide in your heart, what do you want? What do you want today? 
Psalm 42, one says, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, oh my God. What an awesome thing to think. Is that where you are? In the morning, O oh Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you, and I wait in expectation. I talked about this last week. I can't tell you what a wonderful blessing it was when I found this psalm. This is Psalm 5.3. Can you think about a more wonderful gift? I found this. It's like I was digging, and I found a big chunk of gold. It was the most wonderful thing. It says right here, I lay my, re my request before you, and I wait in expectation every morning. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. We, we were on this, and we'll probably be on this a lot. I'll be coming back to it. Now, listen carefully. If I want God to hear my voice and to, and to give me my request, and I'm waiting in expectation, what's the next thing I need to do? I need to look at myself, don't I? Remember, what did God say to Cain? All you got to do is the right thing, man. This is not rocket science. Go get a lamb and bring the lamb. You know, trade some corn and beans with your brother Abel and get a lamb. This is not rocket science. This is you decide to follow Christ and you decide to humble yourself. He goes on here. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Is that what you really want? That was a big problem for me and has been all along. Do I really want God to know my heart? The deepest thoughts that I have, the evil things that roll through my mind? Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you really, really want that? You want him to take away all those things that you secretly, you really like and you, and you really think about? The things that are behind the scenes, as they say? Because that's the key of opening your heart to God. That's the key of the blessings of God. It's it, Listen, guys, let, let's stop here for a second. I got to tell you something. It's not that you don't have these problems. It's not that you don't have these thoughts. That's not the issue. The issue is whether you want God to see them and then to what? Lead you out of that in the right direction. That's what this discussion with Cain was so interesting to me. Is it God's working with Cain? Do you want to, Cain, or do you not want to? And Cain got angry and said, I don't want, I don't want to do it your way, God. And then God even then came back to him and said, Cain, take it easy, man. You can understand sin is crouching at the door, waiting to devour you. You need to turn around and you need to make it subject. You have to take control of that part of your life. Do you have an area in your life right now where you need to take you need to look at it? And say, I need to do it God's way instead of my way. I mean, that happens to me all the time. And maybe it never happened to you. Maybe you haven't thought about it. But I, I suggest you, you begin to think about it, okay? It's really, really important. So let's go further. How could you go further than that, I guess? And I, I'll tell you, the next thing that comes up here, which you guys are going to see, is very appropriate. I put this here on purpose. It's Psalm 51, 1 through 2, and Psalm 51, 10 together. I'm going to tell you right now, right in the Psalms is exactly the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's exactly what I need after I've been in Psalm 139, 23, 24. So here's where I go. Search me. My goodness. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy. What does mercy mean? Don't, don't destroy me in my sin. I deserve to be destroyed. But have mercy upon me, O oh God. According to your Unfailing love. Who's that? What is God's unfailing love? Jesus Christ. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all of my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin through what? Through his blood shed on the cross and his body given to take the wrath. That's how, look, there it is. Psalm 51, 1 through 2. That's the gospel. That's how it works. And look at uh, verse 10. And I always pray, through your resurrection power, because there's no other way. Through the resurrection power, created me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What does that mean, steadfast? It means my goal in life is to serve you. My goal. You know, sometimes I got to tell you, this is, this is so amazing. I, 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 I'm, I won't have thought a bad thought, and I won't have said a bad word, and I won't have done a bad thing. And I just feel 
like there's some pending sin just covering me like a cloud. I'm walking along, everything should be fine, and I just feel like there's sin. And, and I, I haven't, I'm looking through my whole life, I'm doing, Lord, I, show me. And you know what it is? It's crouching at the door. I feel it. And I'm praying, Lord, please, Lord, I pray. I can everything put in my mind. I, I just humble myself before you and forgive me. And then Jesus, through your blood shed, cleanse me, Lord, I pray. And I pray and I pray for a while. And then, and then the imposing cloud just goes away. And, but deep in my heart, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, no matter how wonderful it is, quote unquote, no matter what's going on, thing, deep in there, you know, it's there. It's the flesh. It's there. And what God wants you to do, look at this prayer. Listen to what it says. It says, and created me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew what a steadfast spirit within me. You need that every day. You need to pray for that every day. Don't take it for granted. You need to pray for it. And the next one is Psalm 119, 11 and 12. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I praise you, Lord, and teach me your decrees. There it is, guys. What happens? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with what I just described? You read and study and memorize the word of God. You get in things like this. This group right here is like doing the hard part. You know, there's easy over here and you can do those Bible studies over here and you can do this and you do that. But this group is what? This group is going in there and digging it out, getting it out, getting the screwdriver and digging it out, and getting the stuff out of there and getting it down. You can't even get the bolt on it until we get through cleaning it up. You got to clean it up so you can get the bolt on it and pull that sucker off. And get in there and take care of what has to happen. You guys had never worked on an engine in your life. back. I mean, back in the 50s, in the 60s, when I was back, and they had you doing that kind of stuff, there were some things that you started working on that nobody had pulled that, that bolt off of that head, you know, for 15 years. And to get it off was not, and they didn't have a little spray can where you spray something on and went in there and did it. It didn't work that way. And they're, they're, I'm just telling you, and I'm not a, that old of a guy older than some of you guys, but the point is that that stuff is real. And you have to listen carefully to what God says. You've got to get in there and let him chip it off and let him come in there and put yourself, listen carefully, this is the key to my long story there. Put yourself in a place where you can feel the screwdriver chipping away all the stuff off of you, okay? The barnacles, as they say. Let's go on. All right, the next one is... Um, I love it. The, the word of God is hidden in our heart so that we then can take the word of God and use that to turn away from sin. Now, verse uh, or Psalm 119, 16 says, I delight in your decrees. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Have you have you memorized? Are you memorizing? I'm working on this passage in, in uh, Genesis chapter four. And I'm telling you guys, I've read, I don't know, Maybe 40, maybe 100, I don't know how many times I've read through there. I read the Bible, the whole thing. But today, the Lord gave me that passage. And it'll never leave my heart. Do you understand? It'll never leave me. Because God, through his Holy Spirit, said, today, I'm going to teach Don. I'm going to put that in his heart. I'm going to put that so that he has it. To eternity, he knows that. What's the verse he gave you today? Where, what did he give you yesterday? You guys get these emails from me yesterday. I sent out an email to everybody for the new year. I got that passage, and I sent it out. And you know what? It was the passage where Jesus talks about how what? How he comes and abides in people. How? And it was a process. Christ in you, the hope of glory, and how that happens. So that you won't be there on that day when he separates the goats from the sheep and his sheep, and he says, I don't know you. But if you read the passage I sent out, the, the New Year's passage, you'll see how that happens. How it happens. How is it Christ in you, the hope of glory? You don't know? You better look into it. You better think about it. So he goes on further. Uh, Psalm 119, 71. Now, this is one we might want to just make believe it's not in the Bible. This is one, when I found this, one day I found this in studying the Word of God. Now, I had read it year after year after year, and I went right by it. But one year, one day, God said, this is a verse today that you're going to learn. I want you to memorize this verse, and I want you to know where it's at. Psalm 119.71. 
Now listen carefully. It is good, O oh Lord. It is good for us to be afflicted so that we might learn your decrees. And Nancy and I pray this together. Do you know how difficult you're praying with your wife and you got problems already and things are going on and you pray that with your wife? What's the first thing people would say when you pray that to people who aren't Christians, who do, are not walking with God or say they're Christians and they do this? What do you mean it's good for me to be afflicted? Are you crazy? And afflicted here means a lot of stuff. A lot of really stuff. It means your business. It means your health. It means your children. It means your grandchildren. Why is it good for you to be afflicted? It's only good for you to be afflicted if you are a man of God focused on God. When I say only, that's not true. It, 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 God uses that to bring people to him. So what I'm saying is even more important for those who are following Christ. What does it say? James chapter 1. It's good for me when things come and afflictions come because it, it, it makes my faith stronger so that I can be used by God in more meaningful ways. It is good, O oh Lord, for me to be afflicted, for it brings me to your decrees. It brings me to your word. Where does affliction take a person who's seeking God? To the Bible, to the word of God. You know, I, I'm in different Bible studies, okay? And the one thing that's interesting to me is there's, there's you have to be careful in Bible studies because Bible studies, sometimes they try to handle it like a business. The, like, okay, we got this. Okay, we're doing this Bible. Okay, we're coming to it. We're going to go from here. We're going to read here. We're going to go to there. We go to there. And, you know, you roll through the deal and you do that. Now, the problem is that if you, if you do it like that, that's great. You need to do it like that because you need to get that basic information into your mind, know where it's at. You need to know where to go to find out. Second Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, you need to go in there and find out about the rapture and what's going to go on and how it's going to happen. You need to know where that's at. I got it. But you know what you need to? You need to know what it says, listen carefully, to you. To you personally. What does it say to you? When he afflicts you, it helps you learn what it is about the word of God you're supposed to learn. And you need to thank him for that. Uh, Gene and I always talk about our favorite passage. You know, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Gene always throws that back at me, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 16 through 18. And Gene always throws it back to me. He says, I don't know. I, mean, I got to be thankful. You know, he's sitting there. Something's going on. He's grinding his teeth. He says, I don't know how to be. I got to be thankful. I have to be. And, then, you know, you fight, right? You have to fight through it and say, I need to be thankful. <clears throat> well, how can I? And you can, then all of a sudden you start to look at Jesus. You start thinking about Jesus. Then you start remembering, wait a minute, everything's about Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, you got this problem. It's still over there. And they're, the, the, the wild dogs, think of wild dogs. They're over there grabbing a chunk of, taking a piece of you over here and taking a finger off of here. And they're still going at you, right? And you're just looking at Jesus. You remember Stephen, when they were stoning Stephen and he looked up and he saw Jesus in his glory. And he turned to them. I just, he turned to all those guys so I just saw Jesus, and they're stoning him to death. He's being hit, and blood's going all over, and they're, they're crushing him with the stones. And he says, Lord, forgive him. They don't even know what they're doing. And he looks at Stephen, and Stephen does that, and he comes right to the Lord. Do you think Stephen, he was thankful? This was the best day of Stephen's life, ladies and gentlemen. This is the day he'll be remembered for for eternity. How's that? That's the best day for, you know, right? Look at it. And what happened there? And he went to be with Jesus, and that's that is a very good day. He he went from life to life. They think they killed him. They didn't kill him. They just set him free. They set him free. So what is it that you're thinking? And how then can you take that and be thankful in all circumstances? For that's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But think about it. That's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It goes on further. Said, how we do? We're doing pretty good. Okay, so here we go. It was good for me to play. And now, this is the part I like. I love this line. This is Psalm 51 12, because I go through that time that we just went through. It's sort of really a very difficult teaching, and it's a place in, in our lives. It's, it, it's so difficult. And now I love this part. It says, this, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Look at that. That's what it means that we were just talking about, the joy of who Jesus is, what he did. And now you can sustain me through the joy of knowing my salvation. 
Psalm 118, 28 says this, you are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. <clears throat> Can you remember that? Can you remember to exalt and praise God? Psalm 43, 3 says this, send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. It says the light and the truth do what? They guide you to be and to find Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for the day. Thank you for the message. I love you, Lord. And I love you because you love me first. I, I couldn't even love you. I'm not even capable of loving you. And yet you love me so much that I couldn't resist. Because you sent Jesus, Father. Jesus, you came as the Lamb of God. You gave your blood and your body. You paid the price. You went to the cross. and You took the wrath for my sin upon yourself. You, you rose from the dead and defeated the power of sin and death in our lives. And you, you made us born again children of our loving Father God in heaven. Our name's written, written in the book of life for eternity. The most important thing we'll ever say or think is written in the book of life for eternity. Oh, Lord Jesus, give us your Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us. And we pray now for this message to guide and comfort many. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. That was what I needed.